Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for Creme 2 News 10 at 10, where we give you more news in less time. I'm Cody Proctor. Let's get started. We begin tonight with breaking news. The bodies of the three missing people from a boat crash on the Ponderay River from earlier this week have been found. One body was found shortly after the crash that took place on Tuesday. Search teams have spent the last four days searching for the other three. Creme 2's Kyle Simjuk is joining us now in the newsroom with the latest details. While well, all four men on board this boat are from Bonner County, the Sheriff's Office says their families have been notified, and the Sheriff's Office also says they're still investigating what caused this boat to crash. Now, we've heard from several witnesses who say the boat was going way too fast for conditions. Authorities have spent four days and dozens of hours searching this portion of the Ponderay River following Tuesday evening's crash. Tonight, that search came to an end when the fourth and final victim was pulled from the water. The Bonner County Sheriff's Office has not said who was driving the boat, but several people familiar with the area tell Krem 2 it belonged to Greg Diker, who lives just up the river in Laclede. His body was the first to be located Tuesday night. The other three victims on board have been identified as 49-year-old Aaron Fallhaber and 51-year-old Jason Maxson, also from Laclede, and 59-year-old John Schultz of Sandpoint. The Kootenai County Sheriff's sonar team flagged several areas for dive teams to search. The last three men recovered were found between depths of 60 and 90 feet of water, close to where the boat capsized Tuesday around 7 p.m. Wind made the water choppy that day. Witnesses tell Krem 2 the high-performance boat was going very fast. I looked up, basically straight up in the air, flipped over on its um, cockpit side with a, with a bot on the boat's facing forward and uh, as was doing that it was just it was just incredible a great a big wall of water hard to even see the boat but when it was all said and done it was laying in the water in a press release the sheriff's office says all those who assisted after this tragic event offer their sincere condolences to the family members and friends of these four men in the newsroom kyle simchuk crim 2 news Kyle, thank you so much. Moving on now to Nightbeat with a quick look at the day's top stories. Today, an area organization launched a new initiative to make sure the message that hate is not welcomed in Coeur d'Alene gets out. And this is Idaho, and uh, hate doesn't belong here. It doesn't belong in the United States. There's enough hate in the world. We don't need it here. They spent time handing out T-shirts today in downtown Coeur d'Alene. The task force came up with this campaign to spread the idea throughout the community. This is the first effort of many the task force is planning. It is evident that this is not a natural death, yes. A man's body was found in the middle of Rochester Heights Park this morning in northeast Spokane. The entire park was taped off as police investigated the large crime scene. Authorities have not said exactly how the man died, but there was a large amount of blood in the grass where the body was found. The park reopened earlier this evening. A plane crashed on State Route 26 near Milepost 104, close to the town of La Crosse. Washington State Patrol and Life Flight responded when that crash happened. One person was in the plane. They sustained serious injuries. At this time, no other details on their condition have been given. WSP says the road is not blocked, but expect traffic delays as crews work the scene. We'll continue to bring you more as soon as we learn it. Well, some good news on the Thor Freya corridor. The project thus far looks to be on schedule thanks to a new piece of equipment that was brought in to help con keep construction on track. According to Spokane City officials, they've brought in a slip form paper, which, by the way, these are usually used for building interstates and airport runways. The paver has the ability to lay down a high volume of concrete in less time. City officials expect that process to take a few weeks and keep it on schedule, despite the impact the recent rainy weather had on the installation. And that was a look at your night beat. To learn more about any of these stories, just text the word night to 509-448-2000. We'll send them right to your phone. In the meantime, let's switch over and switch gears now to check in with our forecast because as we head into the holiday weekend, a lot of people want to know what we could be seeing as will it be clear skies, will it be hot temperatures? Meteorologist Michelle Boss joining us now because she 
is the one with the answers. Yes, there will be some of that, but if you do have plans that require sunshine, warm weather, quiet weather, say like going to the lake, I would advise doing it on Saturday. We should have a fair amount of sunshine and warm temperatures. Things start to go downhill Saturday night. So Saturday, sunny skies, high temperatures in the upper 80s. Storms are on the way for Saturday night, though. Could be as early as Saturday evening. Sunday, chance of thunderstorms, cooler temperatures in the upper 70s and uh, things get even colder and stormier as we head into 4th of July. We do have a flood watch that goes into effect for Saturday evening through Monday evening for most of northern Washington, the northern panhandle. Heavy rains with thunderstorms could cause flash flooding, though things are relatively quiet right now and should be dry through most of the day. Tomorrow it is going to be a warm evening with temperatures already or still in the mid 70s. We'll be cooling off into the low 60s overnight. Plenty of sunshine tomorrow and plenty of heat. Michelle, thank you so much. By the way, as we head into one of the busiest travel weekends of the year, we've got everything you need to know for an easier trip. The Washington State Department of Transportation released these graphics showing when the traffic's expected on eastbound I-90 from North Bend to Cleelum. Heavy traffic's expected tomorrow afternoon. However, eastbound traffic is expected to be the worst on the 4th of July. And AAA released the best and worst times to travel. Now, ideally, you would have wanted to have left yesterday before 7 o'clock in the morning and after 8 at night. Today, it was best if you had left before 10 this morning or after 9 p.m. And finally for Saturday tomorrow before noon and after 7 in the evening. I had to get back to see family I haven't seen them since COVID. So it really wasn't a question. We just had to do it. But we won't be going away for the rest of the summer. That's it now. And it isn't just the biggest travel weekend in the region. Cancellations, crowds and complications are hitting people all across the world. TSA says it screened more people yesterday than it did on the same day back in 2019 before the pandemic. And speaking of flights, let's take a look right now. While AAA says most Americans are expected to drive this weekend, the TSA says it's preparing for pre-pandemic traffic levels. Many of those travelers will be met with delays though. At SeaTac, there have been 125 delays and eight cancellations today alone. The bulk of those delays belong to Alaska Airlines, but all the cancellations are Delta flights. The Atlanta-based airline announced last month that it would be cutting about 100 flights per day starting today through the start of August. President Joe Biden laid out his plans to help women following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Today, the president met with nine Democratic governors about protecting women's rights. Many Republican-led states that have moved to restrict or ban abortion rights argue the federal government should stay out of the decision-making. In the meantime, Democratic governors promised their states will be safe havens for women coming from places outlawing abortion. Because of our location in the southeast, Mr. President, North Carolina is already seeing an influx of patients coming to our state. We are, in fact, that brick wall against uh, this uh, horrific Supreme Court decision. President Biden stated the federal government will protect women who want to travel to other states to get an abortion. Well, this year on August 3rd, the Idaho Supreme Court will hear arguments on whether to pause the state's trigger laws. Planned Parenthood previously filed two lawsuits with one against the Idaho legislature and the other filed against the state itself. The court says it'll only hear arguments based on three issues. One, whether the court decides on a pause of Idaho's trigger law during the lawsuit. Two, whether the clinic's second lawsuit should be consolidated into their first lawsuit and three, whether the case should be transferred to the Idaho Supreme Court. We just want to be heard. We want to know that our lives matter and we want to be found. And that's what this alert system does at the end of the day. Starting today, Washingtonians will start seeing a missing person alerts specifically about indigenous people. It's called the Missing Indigenous Person Alert or MIPA. Here's how it works. When a person is reported missing to tribal or local police, the investigator on the case can now ask Washington State Patrol to issue an alert. Once activated, you could see the alert on highway signs, social media, and on WSP's Twitter page. And that was your Creme 2 News 10 at 10, where you get more news in less time. But don't go to bed just yet. The Spokane Police Department's moving into the old East Central Library, but the announcement sparked heated community reaction. 
we look at exactly where and when this controversial move is happening. We're back in just 90 seconds.